I just want you all to know that with your combined effort there, I still have more to go. I could have kept going. I was just being kind. Welcome to our worship service this morning. It is an honor to be able to worship our God alongside you, to be able to say thank you to God for one another and for those who have shaped our lives and our faith and brought us here today. Let's take a few minutes here and look over our announcements. Let's go ahead and take a look-see here at this first sheet. One of the first couple things I want to point out to you is the Day of Carrying Pancake Brunch is coming up. Uh, that is going to be February 25th from 12 to 2. I have been reminded to keep the service concise. Um, uh, no lengthy ramblings. Uh, get to the point. Jesus loves us. Move along. There's food. Um, that wasn't told to me that way. That's how I translated it in my head. Uh, so, <laughs> um, we are looking for a couple things from you in that case. One, if you're willing to help prepare it, you want to talk to Karen Dillon. She's uh, the go-to person for that. And more than anything, we're looking for your bellies. We want to fill it. We want to put food in it. So please, do come be part of it. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring your neighbors. Um, find a person you don't know, grab them, but don't make it look like a kidnapping, and bring them to this as well, too. Shh, no, you're done. You hear the weirdest times to hear. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love you. So uh, we would like to have as many people as possible, and other neighboring churches have been informed of this as well, too, and are invited as well, and we look forward to having as many people as possible. The Wednesday night meal and activities continue. Uh, the, uh, ooh, now we're putting the menu in here. I like this. Ooh, chicken and noodles, mashed potatoes, peas, and salad. You know what? You all don't want to come to that. I'll just leave. I, I'll eat it for you. I'll, I'll, I'll eat it for you. Uh, after the meal, of course, we also then do have our, our time of arts. And what is very wonderful about the arts and crafts is that I'm terrible at them, but even I feel like I know what I'm doing uh, because we have a fantastic teacher, and we are thankful for her. Hope, I'm get, complimenting you, and you immediately went, eh, like this, like, no. No. You A, have a terrible poker face, and B, you're good at what you do. So C, <laughs> moving onward. Uh, so that's going to be Wednesday evening as well, too, and we'd love to have you come and be part of that. The Shepherding Prayer Group is set to meet on Tuesday, February 20th. Randy, okay, Randy just told me that he is going to bump that up a week to February 13th. So not the 20th, but a week sooner. Not this Tuesday, next Tuesday. Great. And the So What group continues to meet as well, too, Wednesday mornings from 9 to 12. And uh, they would love to have you come and be part of that. And the final thing I want to say is we continue to partner with St. Vincent de Paul and uh, Fairview Brethren Church uh, as they are also part of the East Dayton Fellowship uh, that we're part of as well, too. And so if you have any clothing or shoes or gloves or hats or food items to donate, you can leave them back there. There's baskets back there, and they get to where they need to get to as well, too. Sue uh, Warner has, been, uh, has made that one of her ministries, and we are very thankful for that as well, too. Okay, uh, I've said enough. Even though there's more to be said, it's now your turn. Do you have any announcements you'd wish to share this morning? Negative. I'm not letting you have a microphone. Seeing no announcements at this time, I invite you to stand as you're able, turn, greet, say good morning to one another. Will you guys please join me for the call of worship printed in your bulletin? <clears throat> Jesus told the disciples, this is why I've come. Jesus declared, this is why I've come. Jesus and his evil. Jesus stated, this is why I've come. The ones who follow him look for him. Jesus declared, this is why I've come. Jesus brought healing and peace. Amen. Join me for the prayer of invocation. 
Lord, whose patience, grace, and love are our foundation of life and hope, we gather in this time of worship seeking you. As you perform miracles, as you demonstrated love, as you challenged power that abused, you did not dwell on what was done, but on what needed doing. Your disciples expected you in one place, and they found you in another, and you called them, go to yet more. This is the life of faith you call us to, O oh God, a life that does not rest until your love and peace are felt. May we be supportive, sp supported in that work. Amen. Our first hymn today in the blue hymnal, this little light of mine is found on page 401. You may be seated, and I invite us to join together in singing Jesus Loves Me as the children come forward for the children's story. Good morning, and I'm glad to see you guys here. And I want you to think about your favorite color. Don't tell me what it is and how you would describe it and the something that is in that color. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you, tell the, everybody else a funny little story. I read a book. It's called Can't Wait to Get to Heaven by Fanny Flagg. And if you want to laugh and have a really interesting view of heaven, read that book. It is so funny. Well, this woman passes away, and she goes to heaven, and she gets to go, I think, believe she goes in the Cadillac, because she always wanted to ride in the Cadillac, and she never had any money. And uh, so uh, God sent a big, uh, big red Cadillac and took her to heaven. And she got there, and the darnest thing was she met God's wife. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just, it unfolds, and it is so funny. But one part of it was that uh, God's wife said, oh, I'm the one who pre created the rainbow of all the colors. You know, God just, uh, he just thinks in black and white. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't want any color. And she, he said, well, if you're going to create that world, I'm going to have some color in it. So she was the one who came up with the idea of having color in nature and color all around it. I just, I laugh and laugh when I think about that book because it was so funny. But it had some poignant things about going to heaven. And uh, anyway, the lady comes back and tells everybody about what heaven was like. But it's a good book and it's easy to read. Um, but uh, color, go, 
God, I mean, if you look at this, God has made so much color. I mean, just look at our stained glass windows. Aren't they all full of colors? Well, I, I don't even think we could count all the different colors we see. Yeah, everybody's going to tell me their favorite color. Okay, so, all right, are you ready to tell me? Ready to sit up and tell me? Okay, and your favorite color is? Purple. Whoa, okay, and what do you know, what can you tell me about that's purple? Um, I like things that are just purple. Okay, tell me one thing that is purple. Purple towels. Oh, yeah, purple towels. Okay, Thomas, what's your favorite color? Pink. And can you tell me something that is pink? Flamingos. Flamingos. Do you know why they're pink? Um, shrimp they eat. That's exactly right. It's the shrimp they eat that make them pink. And what is your favorite color? Yellow. And can you tell me something that's yellow? A banana. A banana. banana. Teal. Teal. Oh, did you hear that? Teal. And what's teal? A crayon. A crayon. What is your favorite color? Orange. Is it really? What's what? Can you tell me? Is orange? Uh, orange. <laughs> See, very smooth. he is very smooth. Very good. It is orange. And what is your favorite color? Black. Black. And tell it. Tell us something that's black. Fifty percent of my wardrobe. Ooh, fifty percent. Ooh, we're not getting into what those things are, but we'll just leave it at that. Black is her favorite color. Okay, now close your eyes. Now, do you see any colors? No colors? Are you sure? Hey, your eyes are open. Oh, well, now you see. Oh, now you see black. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Okay, now. That if you have if you have your eyes closed, it's kind of like if someone were blind. Now, how do we tell about colors to somebody who's blind? So keep your eyes closed and tell me how would you tell them? How would you tell them about what color orange is? What would you say? He is thinking very hard. I can see that. Can you? Huh? Well. They may need glasses. Nope, this person is blind, totally blind. How do we tell colors to somebody who's blind? Okay. Wait. Tell me. Go ahead. Wait. Uh, wait. Wait, okay. I don't know what. I don't. Wait. Huh? Can't think of anything? Boy, is it hard, isn't it? Give them a textbook definition. Oh, give them a textbook definition. All right, tell me what kind of a textbook. You have to describe pink to somebody. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. It's pink. It's pink. They can't see pink. It's a lighter version of red. But they can't see pink. <laughs> I know. Boy, that would be, okay, you can open up your eyes. That would be really hard, wouldn't it? To try to describe some color. Some colors they say, oh, this is blue is a cool color. So something that's... I like blue as well. You like blue as well, uh-huh. It takes blue and red to make purple, doesn't it? And it would be very difficult for somebody who's blind. Okay, how many of you guys have ever seen Jesus? In pictures. Have you ever seen Pitt? Have you ever, did he come walking down our aisle any day that we saw? We have not seen Jesus, have we? But our job is to describe Jesus to other people. So how do we do that? Especially somebody who hasn't seen Jesus. Ooh, that is hard, isn't it? That really makes you think it's hurting, isn't it? It's almost like school. Your brain is at work. How do we describe Jesus when we haven't seen him? Jesus somebody who sacrificed for us. That's exactly right. He did sacrifice for us. He gave his life so that we would live and have eternal life with God. But it is really hard. If for somebody who has never seen Jesus and we are supposed to tell them about Jesus, that is a huge task. That is really difficult. It's as difficult to tell people about Jesus as it is to tell blind people what colors are. Now, 
if we had an orange here, we could kind of scratch it and smell it, and we would smell that. And people who are blind have to use their other senses, or they would feel how cool it was and cold an orange is. I love oranges myself. And that would give them an, an idea. It wouldn't exactly tell them the color of the orange, but it would explain what the orange was. But we have to come up with ways to describe Jesus. Jesus was loving. Can you hold on to love? Can you? Here's a piece of love. Huh. No, but here's a hug. You, a hug. Or there, there's all kinds of ways of showing it, but you can't pick it up and carry it with you because it's in your heart. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is in our heart. And when we think about describing Jesus, we have to have people open up the eyes of their heart to see Jesus, which is very difficult. We have a big job ahead of us. We have to tell other people about the love of Jesus without having necessarily concrete things to point to and show. So we all have that job, not just us here, but Everybody has that job of telling others and living a life where they can see Jesus. There's lots of times people can say, oh, I can see Jesus at work in this person or in an activity. And that's the best way of telling people about Jesus is to live like Jesus, which is very hard. And he, he calls us to be his disciples, to tell about his great love. That's our job. Well, we've got a big job this week, don't we? We've got to live like Jesus and tell people about Jesus and let people see Jesus in us. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for coming up. God loves you, and I love you. Okay, let's go back and learn some more. We are a people who have been born into a world and raised in a culture and participants in a way of being that often leaves hope seemingly far away. A way of life that seems to choke out hope, silence joy, and stifle peace. Yet as God's people, we know that it is not what we are called to be. We trust that if we follow the ways of Jesus, that hope, joy, and peace can be felt over and above our anxieties and struggles. When we present our offering, we are declaring that we will not be victims of fear-based fear -based hoarding that permeates our culture. Instead, we will be joyful rebels, seeking to show God's love where it might not otherwise be felt. Come, sisters and brothers, be a joyful rebel. Ushers, please come forward.
Lord, may this offering we give guide us to where you are. Show us. Teach us. Pull us away from the places of comfort we have long known and invite us to journey with you into the places that we might be weary and worried to go. Lord, use this offering to guide us to you and to use it as you would use us in any way that you see fit. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to turn in your blue hymnal worship book to our next hymn this morning. Hymn number 338, I Know Not Why God's Wondrous. Scripture reading for today is Mark 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, 
left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found them, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Admittedly, these stories are a bit weird, mostly because this is still the introduction in the Gospel of Mark of who Jesus is. And these stories are told in quick, rapid succession and told in such a way to do two things. One, to kind of catch people up to what just happened. So you have the, you know, previously in the life of Jesus kind of thing. But then also told quickly so as to destabilize people's beliefs of what a Messiah was supposed to be. Because, again, you cannot hear the story of Jesus and not remember the background to who these stories are being told to. These are people who have been conquered by Rome. And for the longest time that anybody can remember, believed that the Messiah's job was to kick Rome out. To kick the oppressor out. So that the Jewish people could be in charge again. But these stories follow what we talked about last week, which was the recognition of the demons to who Jesus actually is, the Son of God. And it's, it's a thing that astounds people, but doesn't necessarily convince them, that doesn't necessarily lead to people following him. Jesus clean, cleanses the demon out of the man as, quote, one with authority. That story positioned Jesus as different than the religious leaders of the day, the legal experts of the day. And as such, Mark is continuing to shift the expectations of what a Messiah should do and should be. Again, it is impossible to ignore the fact that this is a community that is struggling, that is hurting, that is decimated at its very core. They're trying to understand what happened, why they lost, why they are now scattered all over the Roman Empire again. This gospel is written to areas of high population where Jewish people likely would have scattered after the failed revolution, mostly because, A, it's a good place to kind of get lost in the crowd, to kind of be anonymous, and still somehow make a living. The Gospel of Mark then tries to show that Jesus is different than the religious leaders, the legal experts, the leaders of the revolution that led to the destruction. Jesus is different than everything they were thought and taught to believe the Messiah would be. And as such, Mark's story continues to show that Jesus will be different than what they expect or what they have come to be used to. Jesus is different. That's the summary. That's it. That's, that's, that's the thing to know going into all of this. And here are three stories that continue to shift that narrative. For starters, we have the story of Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Or, or do we? Is, well, the scripture tells the story in verse 31, and he says, so he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Doesn't say there was a miracle. Doesn't say there was a healing. 
It says he went to her, offered his hand, helped her up. I've helped many people up out of chairs. I don't think I healed them. I've helped many people after they've fallen down, both figuratively and literally. I wouldn't say I healed them. Maybe, maybe then in that one verse, that one very quick sentence, something else is maybe working. Maybe it's different than what we think. Maybe he sat with her first. Maybe he just sat and spent time with her. Throughout Scripture, when there are people who are sick, we find again and again that those who sit with them are the ones who do God's work. My favorite example of that is, again, is the story of Job. Job's friends, which we so often say, well, they were bad for him. Actually, for a week, they were great for him. Why? They didn't say a word. They just sat with him. They didn't try to justify what was happening. They didn't try to explain it away. They just sat with him. It's not until they start trying to justify it that they screw up. Maybe Jesus sat with her, or maybe he did just walk in and help her up. I don't know. We don't know. It's, it, it doesn't say. We're told throughout our tradition, we're taught that Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother. But it doesn't say that. It just says he helped her up. Again, Jesus is different than we expect. Because this, this ambiguity, this uncertainty seems to be intentional, as Mark's audience would have assumed that any healing would have been spoken of as a way of how, showing how important the healer was. That if Jesus had healed him, there would have been people who would have followed and listened and done everything he, he said. But remember, this is also the same guy who just a few sentences before chased out demons. People were amazed, but nobody changed. But before Mark lets the people think about that a little bit, he then says, well, as soon as she was better, she got up and started serving them. Well, okay, that, I got to tell you, maybe it's because I was raised in a matriarchal family, that, that would not have gone over well in my life. Graham, you're feeling better? Great. Can I have some homemade bread? You can get it yourself. Can I have some pudding? Go ask someone else. I literally just stopped being sick. But it does make an interesting point. That if you're going to be connected to Jesus, be ready to serve, even when you don't think you can. But again, before you can even dwell on that point, Mark just keeps going. Mark, Mark, is, Mark is really quickly trying to knock down what you think and what everybody thought the Messiah was going to be. Before much conversation can happen about the healing and the chasing out of the demons, Jesus goes out after sunset and heals people who are sick. There we have legitimate, not, not that the story of Simon Peter's mother-in-law is not legitimate, but here we have Scripture saying legitimately that Jesus goes out and then heals people. However, we don't know who those people are. We know nothing about those people, just People, random human beings, nameless figures that people walk past long after Jesus has healed them. And he does this after sunset. And that's another interesting little tidbit that shows up later on. There's, there's a, a prophet, or not a prophet, there's a, a Pharisee that shows up later on in the story of Jesus named Nicodemus. Nicodemus shows up at night. Nighttime, any time after sunset, was often believed to be a time where bad things happened. Nothing good happened in darkness. 
Nicodemus showing up to see Jesus is, has been interpreted by scholars throughout history as Nicodemus being ashamed or trying to hide away from his Pharisee buddies but still wanting to be near Jesus. And that's a conversation for another time, but what I'm showing you here is at the very beginning of the story of Jesus, Mark shows that Jesus is not going to be conformed to what everybody believes because he goes out after sunset when it's scary, when it's dangerous, when no good, right-thinking person would go out and do anything. Jesus, it seems, is not going to be where he is expected to be. He's going to go and go out. And as such, challenges the conventional wisdom of humanity, which often focuses on protection of self and a fear of going out. Later then, the next day, and, and this is, <laughs> it, it's maybe one of my favorite lines, they go looking for Jesus, hunting for Jesus. And the reason that makes me laugh is because as a kid, we moved from a rural area to a slightly less rural area in that we had stoplights in our town. We were highfalutin. I had a street that I lived on with other kids around. And one of the first things that we did, that they did, was they took me snipe hunting. Ah, see? Ah, if you don't know what snipe hunting is, it means you had friends who liked you. If you know what snipe hunting is, it means you have friends who didn't like you at first. Snipe hunting is that glorious game in which we go looking for something that doesn't actually exist. It's that thing where you tell the new person or the person you don't really want to be around who doesn't get the joke, oh yeah, I think I saw a snipe over there by that tree, by that creek. Way over there. And they go looking. And if you really want to sell it like the people on my street did, they give you a burlap bag. Where did we find a burlap bag in the 80s? I would love to know where a bunch of townie boys found a burlap bag. Actually, I take it back. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. There's more information there than I care to know. So that idea of snipe hunting, of going looking for something that isn't actually there, kind of shows up here in this story of Jesus because they go hunting for Jesus. They're looking for Jesus. And where they thought Jesus would be and what Jesus was doing, Jesus wasn't. Jesus wasn't what they thought. And it's not till they go looking for him that they realize how different he is. Verse 37, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. I love that line. Jesus, everyone's looking for you. Great, let's leave them. Let them keep looking. Let them follow. We've got other work to do. The work of Jesus is not about staying stationary in the work that was done, about saying, Look how great it was that I healed this woman. Look at all these people that were cursed by demons. Look at all these people who were sick that are now healed. Look at everything I've done. Jesus says, no, I've come to, to, to do this for everybody. And to do this, I've got to keep going. I've got to keep moving. That is why I have come. He has not come to get power. He has not come to be a military leader. He has not come to evict the Romans like everybody wanted their Messiah to do. Instead, he has come to lead a different revolution. This revolution will lead to a loosening of the firmly held barriers that humans have created. For example, Jesus will heal some Romans. He will challenge the good leaders of the Jewish people. He will break laws like healing on a Sabbath. He will be in unexpected places with unexpected and uncomfortable people. And he will challenge those who follow him, who look for him, and tell them to do the same.
there is a popular, albeit flawed, conversation, anecdote of sorts that wonders, what would Jesus think if Jesus were to walk into a church today? The question is meant to give people a space to reflect, to consider, and to examine if their actions and their lives match up with Jesus. Some have argued that Jesus would not be in a church, but he would be out and about, healing, serving, listening, caring. Maybe. But Jesus also went to synagogue a fair amount as well, too. So, so the, the question still stands. Because it makes me wonder if this early story of Jesus written to a group of people who are recovering from the truly horrific act of violence and destruction that was visited upon them would maybe give us a moment to consider that question of what would Jesus think if he were to walk into a church now a bit differently. Maybe Jesus would walk in and sit with those who were alone. Maybe Jesus would stand up and teach the church about the reflection of love that comes from breaking out of fear-based labels and barriers that humanity has so often created. There was a... (laughs) Years and years and years ago, before I was a parent, back when I had hair, it was a bad, scary time. When we moved back to Pennsylvania... Uh, we, kind of, we went to the home church I grew up in. It was about 30 minutes away. And if you've ever been in middle Pennsylvania area, um, it's a five-county region that has 57 churches of the brethren. So there, oh, there's a lot of us. Yeah. It, 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 ugh, ugh, there's too many of us. But anyways, we would go to my home church. And in that church, there was a gentleman named Rufus. Any time we did the community prayers, joys and concerns, and Rufus would stand up, Ashley would smack my leg. Because Rufus had some of the most wild thoughts you've ever heard. And they seemed to be connected to nothing whatsoever until he got to his point. No, I did not model my sermons on Rufus, just so we're clear. But the way he delivered these thoughts, it made her laugh because it was a very proper Church of the Brethren during worship. And Rufus would not conform to the very proper way of being. And it made Ashley laugh every single time. When I think about what Mark is trying to do here, I I think about Rufus a little bit. Because the church I grew up in, the church that nurtured me and raised me, has been there for me in ways that I could never have envisioned or imagined before, had a very regimented way of doing worship service. And then there would be Rufus who would do it kind of his own way. And I know it made some people squirm, but I also noticed how many people were completely fine with it. How in that space of what I assumed the church would be just this one way, the church also held space for another way. And loved him for it. Later he'd be called to be a deacon I think he still drove them nuts in deacon meetings as well, too. That was Rufus, one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. And I don't think he knew how funny he was. That's what made it even better. So maybe Jesus would be breaking that up. Maybe Jesus would actively, persistently, doggedly seek to hear those who are not in church anymore and not try to defend the church, but just listen. Just as Jesus held the hand of Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and maybe in listening, those who have left the church can find the desire to serve reignited. Maybe Jesus would step away from all the political bragging or maneuvering of that age or definitely of this age. Because sadly, it looks 
very similar to one another back then as it is now. We are in a politically tense moment again. We do a really good job of humans of getting ourselves into these situations. Of worshiping strong men, strong women, as though they are the the salvation of us all, the protectors of us all. And yet time and time again, there just seems to be a wake of death when they follow. These strong types, these strong men, strong women characters are not new to our day and age. They're not new to the 20th or 21st century. They've been around as long as humanity has existed. And they were around in that first century that Jesus lived as well too, and that this group that Mark is writing to lived through as well. And Mark is trying to show them the people who are in the wake of this devastation. The strong men and the strong women that you've idealized, listened to, followed. How's that going for you? How's that working? Perhaps in hunting for Jesus, in hunting for understanding the audience of Mark, the first disciples and ourselves discover that Jesus is the peace the world has sought because Jesus refuses to be limited by human ways. And it was here I had an ending. And it's here that it doesn't fit. Because when I wrote that, It didn't feel right. Because as much as I talk about the peace and hope of God and believe in its power, I'm also deeply afraid. I worry so, so much about the world my kids are going to inherit. If there's going to be a world. And I know that sounds dramatic. I know that sounds over the top. I know that if you're here right now, you survived at the very least the Cold War, maybe even the Vietnam War. All these times uh, in which uh, we were certain that the world was going to end. And frankly, it probably could have had cooler heads not prevailed. Had people not sought something different than what exists now. What existed then. I see what Mark, at least I think I see what Mark is trying to do. He's trying to strip away the idea that the Messiah, that Jesus, can only be one thing. This great conqueror. And instead, Mark is building an argument saying, Jesus came to heal, for that's why I have come, says Jesus, to heal. So maybe the discomfort in the ending that I had written here is the point. Maybe that's what's supposed to happen. Maybe, maybe that's what we're supposed to glean from this story. That it's not supposed to have a nice, neat ending. That it's supposed to be uncomfortable. That it's supposed to make us squirm. That it's supposed to make us listen to those who we disagree with. Maybe make us listen to those who are outside of our comfort zone. To go instead and just be with them. To just sit with them. To maybe just hold their hands and not worry about if they've earned that right. But just sit with them. Just be with them. Just 
Just be a human. Is it naive? Yep, sure, why not? Call me naive. But all I know is when Jesus did it, there was a whole lot of healing and a whole lot of love and a whole lot of peace that followed. Maybe that's what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. It is difficult to be vulnerable, to expose an area that we think is a weakness. We do not like anyone seeing our weaknesses, our flaws, our errors, yet to hide them and to silence them is a lie. It's false, because we all have them. We've been told, perhaps before for generations, to not air your dirty laundry, to not let people know what all you're struggling with. And yet Scripture couldn't be farther from that very teaching. The life and love of Jesus couldn't be farther from that very way of being. When we share the worries, the weaknesses, the flaws, the hurts, the sufferings, the sorrowful experiences, then we get to be for and with one another. We become a community of compassion, a community of grace, of love, of peace. We become a community where God's love is found. So let us trust that in being that community, that community of love, we can also be a community of joy, of celebrations, of excitements, of hopes, of wonders, joys, and concerns. So be honest with one another, be open with one another, and be loving with one another. After a prayer is lifted, I invite you then to enter into a prayerful space wherein you offer that which you have heard. After a few moments, I will say the words, Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. At which time, please open your eyes and hearts and prepare to receive the next prayer. What do we bring to share this morning? Earlier this week, I asked Sue to send a message through the one call system about my sister's grandson. He was born with a heart defect. He's, I said he's 19, he's 23 years old, been through many heart surgeries, many procedures, but he has, has to watch the, the thickness and thinness of his blood. And they did, he was in a terrible state there for a while, but they got him straightened out and he's back to work. So. Sorry I panicked there, but it's always nice to know that my sister, who who grew up in this church as I did, leans on Salem. And thank you for the one call, because that's a great tool. What's his name? Say his name real quick. His name, uh, I inadvertently called him Joshua. That's his brother. So the good Lord knew that it was Jordan that needed the help. Even if we get the address wrong, the destination gets there. Oh, Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers. And may they know that they are loved. I'm asking for prayers for my daughter-in-law. She is having surgery tomorrow morning in Cincinnati to remove um, two cysts from her backbone.
O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. I shared last week about a friend of mine from back home who um, her husband um, is dying and I have, um, it's still an ongoing process. Uh, The healing from pancreatic cancer is not available. Um, And yeah, uh, she continues to just kind of be numb as is as is expected. So I'd ask that you please continue to hold Megan in prayers. O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Are there any other joys or concerns we would offer up this morning? Yeah, I'd like to offer up a joy of thanksgiving. Um, Many of you know that I'm a naturalist, and I'm outside every day. And I'm noticing that spring is on its way. So my thanksgiving is for sunny days and warmer temperatures and uh, for the spring wildflowers before too long. And while I would love to see that it's also Ohio in February, I hold nothing. (laughs) Anything's possible. O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Anything else? And we have another joy. Doris is going to be 95 on Wednesday, and I think that's a definite joy. You know, and, and, and given as much energy as she expends, I think we can all celebrate her birthday by taking a nap on Wednesday, because frankly, You have energy that I don't know where you're getting it from, but just that thought makes me tired. So on Wednesday afternoon, take a nap to celebrate Carol. O Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are loved. Doris, what's your sister's name? What's your sister's name? Phyllis? I could have sworn it was Karen. I was going to say Doris and Karen. As soon as I said that, I'm like, no, that's not right. But I, my brain does gloriously brainy things. <sighs> I'm going to be a great old man, let me tell you. Are there any other joys or concerns we would share this morning? I think that is an acceptable use of our time of worship. Let us join together and sing happy birthday to you. And many more. Whew. Again, I, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> you don't get any.
Only good people get birthday cake. Nice people get birthday cakes. You get birthday cold. I spoke with Norma Hellstern this week. She's doing great. And her mind is as sharp as ever. She'll be 98 in May. Mm -hmm. So let's say a prayer for her. <laughs> and, and Greenville as they continue to try to keep up with her. <laughs> Oh, Lord, hear the prayers of our sisters and brothers, and may they know that they are